All right, thank you so much for coming today. Um, my name is Andrea Horton Marichli. I'm the Isaac Site Supervisor at Literacy Pittsburgh. I'm also the uh, Workforce Skills Manager at Literacy Pittsburgh. Um, and um, actually, Laurel, did you want to introduce? Yeah, <laughs> actually, I'm Laurel. To do the I think yeah. <laughs> some, some of you might already know me. I'm the Pittsburgh West Program Coordinator. I've been with Literacy Pittsburgh as a coordinator for about two years now. And I'm excited to um, do this to your talk because I know that your students come to you with various things all the time. And it's good to know that these services are available to your student and that you don't have to be the one <laughs> to help them all the time. I know it's easy to, to want to be, I have the same, the same urges to, to jump in and try to, to work things out for students because I know how hard it is for them. I mean, it's hard for US born folks to navigate a lot of these things. So not being a, a, a native English speaker makes it that much more difficult, but there are so many things that Isaac can help your student with that all you have to do is let me know and then I'll refer them and, and then there'll be experts and professionals who will help them through the, various things that they need help with. So you are their English tutor, not their case manager. <laughs> I have to remind myself that sometimes too. So I'm happy you guys are here to, to learn about that. Yeah. And um, I just wanna chime off of what Laurel said. Uh, again, um, uh, case management and service coordination is not in your volunteer duties. Uh, it, we don't want you to feel overwhelmed by any means. So if your student um, uh, requests any kind of services that are outside of the realm of their learning plan um, or their uh, educational goals uh, at Literacy Pittsburgh, um, please let your um, program coordinator know. Um, okay, so as I said, my name is Andrea horton Richley. I am the Workforce Skills Manager and the Isaac Site Supervisor at Literacy Pittsburgh. And I'm excited to be doing this talk with Laurel. So let's get started if this will let me go, what's going on here? <laughs> there we go, okay. Um, so today's objectives, um, by the end of this pre presentation, you will learn what Isaac is and why it came to fruition. You will learn how Isaac can help immigrants in Allegheny County. Again, Isaac is the acronym for Immigrant Services and Connections. You will learn how to refer your students to Isaac for help. You will learn who the Isaac team is at Literacy Pittsburgh. You will learn what services are at Literacy Pittsburgh, um, what services um, at Literacy Pittsburgh are available for non-immigrant students and how to refer them because um, I don't know if um, any of you also tutor CCR students who are non-immigrant. Uh, we also have some uh, assistance for them as well outside of Isaac. So let's get started. What is Isaac? So first, why did Isaac come to fruition? Um, there was a growing immigrant population in Allegheny County. Um, and um, I'm just driving through um, the neighborhoods, you can see different storefronts uh, and different restaurants and different um, grocery markets um, that are kind of clustered in neighborhoods. So, and it's growing. So we saw the an immigrant, a growth in immigrant population. There's language barriers, uh, not just in the community um, at large, but in the, um, the, the K through 12 schools as well. And, and when it comes to employment. Cultural barriers um, with um, all aspects in the community. Um, people from um, other countries, they come with their, um, knowing only their own culture and they get culture shock. And um, a lot of Americans um, and agencies in the community uh, from police departments to hospitals to educational um, organizations, community service employers, um, they, um, they don't understand, a lot of them didn't understand other cultures and how to work with individuals from other cultures, why they're not looking them in the eye, why um, uh, they um, might have certain mannerisms. They and and some Americans were taking offense to it because they just didn't understand it's their culture. So, so this is another reason why Isaac came to fruition. Locals are unfamiliar with serving foreign-born. Um, 
my husband is foreign. He speaks perfect English. He has an accent. I don't know how many times we're in a restaurant. He's ordering something. I'm sorry, what? Can you speak English? It's like, he speaks perfect English better than me. Probably. <laughs> and they looked at me, what did he say? And, and it's like, so people hear an accent, they shut down. Um, and you've probably seen it in, in the community as well. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> uh, it's a hand up, not a handout to help with adjustment. So we aren't giving money away and doing everything for them. We're helping them learn to do things for themselves so they can become self-sufficient. As a group, immigrants are very hardworking. They're entrepreneurial. As I said, how many restaurants and storefronts have you seen that um, uh, pop up that you know, they're offering jobs to the community and services to the community? And they help revitalize neighborhoods. So what is ISAAC? ISAAC stands for Immigrant Services and Connections, and it is an Allegheny County grant awarded to JFCS. Um, JFCS uh, stands for Jew I'm sorry, Jewish uh, Family and Community Services, um, and it is a connector to existing services. So um, ISAAC is not case management or intensive case management. It's more service connecting. So we get referrals sent to us, and we help them connect to other services and make sure that they are getting served at these agencies. We advocate for them. Basic information referral support, service coordination, bilingual navigation. So, um, well, the navigation part is kind of, um, I wouldn't say on a standstill, but it's happening a lot less during COVID times. Um, so every Isaac team um, has a uh, navigator na navigator on staff who is bilingual, um, part of the um, one of the um, immigrant communities in Allegheny County, um, and the navigator helps um, the service coordinators and the clients with connecting clients to the services. So maybe they need um, uh, being they need to learn how to get from here uh, one place to another. So there's bus orientation. Uh, they may uh, meet us at Literacy Pittsburgh downtown and, we, and the navigator walks them to um, the welfare office. So they know where it is, how to get there, how to access the services or the social security office, um, things like that. Um, <clears throat> Isaac is a connector to ethnic communities. So we um, collaborate with and get information and work with um, um, different cultural organizations uh, to help, um, so we can help better serve the, the clients, um, the people um, in Allegheny County that we, um, to help them get connected to services. We provide training on working with immigrants. So, um, We've done a lot of cultural diversity training for um, hospitals, police departments, educational um, organizations, employers, um, for on cultural diversity, on work, um, um, how to um, speak better and converse better with um, um, their immigrant employees or immigrant students, um, how to have um, some cultural awareness uh, to know that American, Americans aren't, America is not the only country in the world <laughs> and that um, we need to be welcoming and should be welcoming um, for, of, of diverse populations from, um, because it just improves the, the community at large. Oops, sorry. Um, if you have any questions or comments during this presentation, please feel free to ask them um, or put them in the chat and, and Laurel can, um, let me know when there's a question because I am unable to see the chat. Okay, so um, some of the Isaac partners or all of the Isaac partners um, are listed above. So um, one of the previous slides said that uh, JFCS was the recipient of the Isaac grant from Allegheny County. They partnered with originally five other agencies. Northern Area Multi-Service Center was one of the partners on this grant but um, they did close their refugee um, department um, in 2017, early 2017. So they, they um, are no longer part of the grant, unfortunately. Um, but these other four, including us, are original partners on the grant. Uh, so Literacy Pittsburgh, 
South Hills Interfaith Movement. And I realized I made a typo. I put South Hill, it should be South Hills Interfaith Movement, Shim. I will correct that before sending it out. Casa San Jose and AIU's Family and Immigrant Connections. So the last two, Casa San Jose and AIU's Family and Immigrant Connections, they work with Latino, uh, Latin, Latino Latinx populations, um, Spanish speakers. Um, and um, South Hills Interfaith Movement works just like with uh, like Literacy Pittsburgh and GFCS with any um, immigrant from any um, country that needs our services. Uh, South Hills uh, Interfaith Movement is located in Baldwin. Um, Casa San Jose is located in um, Beachview. And uh, the Family and Immigrant Connections was located in Homestead, but they moved to McKeesport. Um, and they have a fantastic office. <laughs> now it's like uh, they're in a multi, a huge building with a lot of other social service agencies. So there's a lot of warm handoffs going on now, which is very nice. ISIC's mission is to, to connect vulnerable refugees and immigrants to the resources they need to rebuild their lives while also helping to build a more welcoming community. So uh, we advocate for our clients um, to make sure they get the, the services they need because as it says here, they're, they're vulnerable when, um, and I mean, think of US born people when they are in crises um, and then add on a language barrier and a cultural barrier to that. It just adds on and former PTSD as well if they're the refugees. A lot of our refugees do have some form of PTSD um, and, men, or, and or mental illness. Um, so just add that on and um, it makes them even more vulnerable. So we, um, we guide them and assist them as much as they need to, um, to make sure they get the services and, and the resources they need to, um, to survive and to um, become more self-sufficient. This picture right here uh, was taken a few, pre COVID, of course, <laughs> um, a few years ago. Uh, some of the team has changed. This is all of the, uh, the agencies uh, who decided to go to the Isaac picnic. And um, some of the makeup of the, of the teams, have, uh, the people have changed, but it's kind of representative. You can see uh, there's a lot of um, different, um, even on the Isaac team, there's, uh, it's diverse. So I already said what Isaac is and, and can do. So um, let's talk about what Isaac is not. It is not an interpreter for other provider services. Um, so when we work with our clients, uh, we do offer interpretation and translation. Um, it's up to the client to accept it or not. 99% of our clients do, <laughs> but we do have clients who speak English and say and, and decline uh, interpretation and, uh, and um, trans translation. Uh, but because we offer that and other community agencies know we offer it, when we refer um, our clients to them um, for services, um, it's not uncommon for us, for them to say, um, and you're coming to translate or, or to interpret, right? It's like, no, <laughs> you need to offer your own interpretation. And I will, you will uh, see why we say that in a later slide. Now, there are, is occasion where we do offer the interpretation just because uh, there's some agencies that are unable to. Um, oh, sorry, it's this side. So Title VI of the Civil Rights Act um, says uh, pro uh, prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin. Any agency or organization that receives any kind of federal assistance is required by law to provide interpretation and transportation, no, not transportation, trans, <laughs> translation, I wish transportation, interpretation and translation to people they serve, uh, whether it's um, by phone uh, interpretation or in person, um, an in-person interpreter coming. They should not be having children interpret and translate for them, especially for a parent, because uh, there's a lot of sensitive information and there's a lot of information I can guarantee that they do not understand, words they don't understand. So um, by law, they need to, uh, these agencies need to pay for um, interpretation and translation for people they serve. So that is why we say, no, we're not going to uh, provide our interpretation out of our own funds when we know you're getting funded for this as well. Uh, we are not a provider of concrete services or intensive case management. 
we are a connector and a referral source. So um, as I said, we help when we get clients referred to us, we uh, do an intake to assess all their needs and um, we uh, connect them to the agencies and the services that they need um, um, that will help them address those specific needs, whether it's a food pantry or welfare, we'll help them with the, um, the applications and the, um, the enrollment process and, um, and make sure that they get those needs. Um, so if they, are, if they have a lot of um, things to address, that are extremely intensive and uh, take will take like a year plus or longer than six months uh, to address. We try to find um, case management for them. Um, JFCS uh, does have an intensive case manager on staff. Thank goodness they finally got one, got one uh, because um, especially during COVID, as you can imagine, there was a lot of stuff um, going on. Domestic violence increased, um, uh, homelessness, um, not able to pay the bills, it, it, a mental illness increase, uh, episodes increased. Um, people uh, were scared to go to their doctor because they had to take the bus. So they weren't getting their medicines and their prescriptions and stuff. So it's, um, there was a lot, um, this, a lot of things we could help with, but the more intensive stuff we um, we'll refer out to. How can Isaac help our immigrant students? Isaac will connect clients to services, including all these wonderful things. So public benefits. So as I said, um, public benefits are welfare. So we will help them with the application process um, and um, ensure they get um, connected, uh, get the services they need. If they get denied, we'll talk with the, the caseworkers over at DHS to see why they got denied and, um, and, and fight for them if we know that they should have been accept, approved. Because a lot of times mistakes happen um, in, the, in the system side and, um, and we will reapply if we have to. Financial and utility assistance. Isaac does have some funding for um, um, assistance for this. Uh, we do try to refer out to other agencies as much as possible because we have a limited, um, every agency has a limited amount of funds. So um, we don't want to exhaust them, um, our funds within the first three months of our, our fiscal year because uh, we have to stretch it out. Um, school enrollments, um, we work with households. Uh, not just one one person in the household, unless there's only one person in the household. But a lot of times, it's it's a family and they have kids. Um, so we we will help with um, getting the children vaccinated to and enrolled in schools. Make sure they get the ESL programs that they need um, and um, any other um, support that they need. If they if the child has a disability, we'll make sure that. Um, uh, they're connected to some of the agent uh, community agencies that will help with that as well and also advocate for the school to include other types of services. Uh, we help with medical appointments. Now, um, that means setting up medical appointments, um, getting people their medical insurance, um, and uh, making sure they get the interpretation and translation at these appointments. Um, we help with housing search. Uh, we don't help with housing itself, but we help with um, accessing housing. Uh, whether it's a low-income housing, public housing, or um, you know Section Eight, or um, just finding an apartment or something, um, if they do have uh, income, we help uh, connect individuals to legal assistance, and that's all types of legal assistance, uh, from immigration to civil to um, <clears throat> to uh, um, um, what's a criminal. Uh, Believe it or not, we have had some a couple criminal cases, um, not too many, thank goodness. General culture information. So we, we do um, um, talk about uh, the American culture with our clients, uh, ask, answer any questions that they have. We'll um, do financial literacy, budgeting, um, help them get connected to financial um, education resources as well. Uh, we try to meet the, the client or slash student where they're at when they come to us. And all this is um, comes out, a lot of the stuff comes out during the first meeting at intake. Um, when we were in person, all intakes, all first meetings happened in the household because 
um, of that cultural difference, uh, some of uh, uh, the uh, the clients um, it might some things might not be an issue for them, but in the United States, it could be uh, something that they could um, their child could be taken away from them if they weren't careful, um, like sleeping on the floor. Um, the children didn't have. Uh, don't have beds or um, they don't have heat <laughs> or um, or the, maybe some education like their heat they ha they have their win their heater on their windows open they have the stove on and the, the you, know, you know trying to keep it warm all these different dangers they might have um, uh, food laying out um, all these are, so a lot of education can happen but now that uh, it's it's during COVID we aren't able to do the initial um, uh, meeting in in the house so uh, we're not um, it's very rare when we do go in the house these days um, but we, it does happen but um, so we really have to rely on what the, the client tells us um, and really ask a lot of in-depth questions so we can try to get as much information as possible so we can help them with what they need to try to prevent, um, for lack of a better word, recidivism to the Isaac program. Um, a lot of our, not a lot of our clients, but some of our clients are frequent flyers when it comes to Isaac um, because life happens, you know, it's ever changing. So, um, and things may have fallen through or um, like with social security benefits. Um, sometimes, you know, you help them apply, a lot of times you help them apply and then there's a waiting period. So we cannot keep them on our case, active caseload and if they're just waiting, right? So we close them, let them know, like when you hear something from, when you get a letter from Social Security, contact us. So there's things like that. So I already uh, mentioned that interpretation and translation are provided for all of our Isaac clients. These are some of our partners. Uh, some of the main partners that we have. So Women's Center and Shelter is, um, uh, a wonderful place for um, our um, victims of domestic violence who have children to go to, um, who, who have or may not have children to go to. Uh, and they have a lot of just like wraparound services there. Uh, Justice at Work, um, they are uh, a wonderful organization that provides advocacy and legal assistance to um, employment related items like discrimination or advocacy or um, uh, unemployment and things like that. Squirrel Hill Health Center, um, I think it speaks for itself, it's a health center. <laughs> um, and this, oh, St. Vincent de Paul is just wonderful. But uh, the only negative thing I have about to say about them is that they're zip, they're, um, it's by zip code. So if, if a client doesn't live in a zip code where there's a St. Vincent de Paul organization, they can't get served <laughs> by St. Vincent de Paul. But besides that, the, um, the clients that do get served by them, they are fantastic. Um, they help a lot with rental assistance, utility assistance, um, uh, things like that. GFCS Immigration Legal Services, that speaks for itself. The Career Development Center uh, for Employment and also Unemployment. Um, the Career Development Center was, um, uh, really jumped in and helped us uh, during um, COVID. Uh, any unemployment, uh, any client who came uh, wanting to apply, uh, apply for unemployment or who had issues with unemployment, it was a straight referral to the Career Development Center because they were on it. I was like, whew. <laughs> um, and then the offices of Leah Fink. So Leia is uh, wonderful. So anytime um, a client gets denied, um, when they apply for social security income and they get denied and um, they, uh, really do have some uh, disability and, and stuff and, and uh, struggle with finding and maintaining employment. Um, we refer the, um, that client to Leah, who um, will help them with their appeal and, and, and make sure they get uh, um, the interpretation and translation that they need as well. Pittsburgh Public Schools um, uh, for the K through 12, the kids in K through 12 and the families. Um, foreign management is one of the uh, uh, um, the apartment management uh, organizations that really uh, rents a lot to um, our immigrant population. Um, it's every now and then we have an issue with them, but um, for the most part, they're pretty, they're pretty great. Uh, Bridge Outreach um, works with our homeless population. We do have some homeless um, immigrants and refugees, uh, mainly due to mental health issues. 
um, and and addictions uh, because um, as a um, coping mechanism for the mental health. Um, uh, so they really help out a lot. Um, financial Empowerment Center is great for financial literacy. Um, Health Law Project is wonderful for getting uh, clients um, connected with uh, who are not able to, uh, who are denied medical assistance or aren't able to qualify for medical assistance. Um, they help them with uh, get set, to get set up with other types of uh, medical insurance. Christian Immigration Advocacy, Advocacy Center is uh, another agency, um, legal agency that um, helps individuals um, with their immigration legal issues and applications and everything like that. They are um, a, uh, they are not expensive. They're not like a private lawyer. So JFCS is free. Uh, the client does need to pay for applications. But uh, Christian Immigration Center, Advocacy Center is, um, we call them kayak, C-I-A-C, kayak, um, or there is kayak, kayak. Um, we, they are very low, low cost. They really try to work with the, um, the individual and, and sometimes don't charge them until things happen and then they get them on a payment plan um, at, at a, lo a lot lower um, rate than a private lawyer. They're, um, there, um, I think there's only one paid a staff member there. All the rest are volunteer lawyers. It's just wonderful. Global Wordsmiths is a, a local uh, translation interpretation company uh, that um, uh, will, um, for our students who um, want to get their documents translated, uh, they're one of the agencies I use to get a quote from. They're not always the cheapest, but um, I, may, I leave it up to the student to decide, but they are also a great organization that we used when uh, we uh, needed in-person interpreters for certain uh, meetings. Um, we would uh, contract some of their, um, their uh, uh, interpreters. They also um, partnered with us a couple of years ago. Um, and um, so they partner every, every quarter with a nonprofit uh, and provide free interpretation and translation services uh, for that nonprofit for that quarter. And a couple of years ago, it was us and they translated so many things for us. It was like, you know, submitting, submitting, we submitted all this stuff <laughs> and um, it was just awesome. So it's like their, their give back. And they're really not all that, that old either. I think they, um, uh, Mary Jane McCullough, who's the executive director and founder, I think she started it in like um, 2017. It, it wasn't that long ago, maybe late 2016. So um, they and, and they're they're growing and they made a nice impact. So these are just some of some of the partnerships that we have um, in Allegheny County uh, that we use to help our clients. Um, I do want to reiterate that um, uh, students need to live in Allegheny County to qualify for Isaac services. This is our Isaac team. Uh, so I'm the supervisor. Kara Wimberly is one of our uh, full-time service coordinators. I hope they're gonna, not gonna kill me for putting their pictures on <laughs> the presentation. Uh, Tiffany Humble is uh, one of the other full-time service coordinator and Nora Andrews is our, our AmeriCorps member, Compass AmeriCorps member. So every um, uh, contract year for AmeriCorps, we do get an AmeriCorps member to help us out with uh, Isaac. And we usually have um, our AmeriCorps members do the, the office hours, which are right now they're virtual. And I'll talk more about the office hours in a little bit. So, but that's our team at Literacy Pittsburgh. So the main thing you're probably wondering, like how the heck do I refer my student to Isaac and what qualifies them? <laughs> um, so this is a general, um, referral um, process for the community at large. Um, for you as a tutor, um, you'll go through a um, slightly different process to refer them, but for the community at large, so if you know an immigrant or refugee that is not a student, um, you can, um, boy, where's my, there, there's, you can either um, call or email Isaac um, uh, on, the web, the, on the website, you can, uh, you can do a referral. Um, and then that, um, that referral, either by phone, email, or online, will go to the intake office at JFCS, who's, the, as I said, the mother of the grant. And then JFCS will, um, someone, one of the intake coordinators at JFCS will call that, that client, that, that individual, and will either do 
um, a quick information assistance or referral, like getting their information, giving them a little, um, the assistance they need very quickly and referring them out to another agency to get connected to the services they need. Um, and, uh, or they will deem that they're, there's a lot of things that need to be worked on that are time consuming and they will refer them uh, to the waitlist for service coordinator, uh, service coordination. And the service coordinator will um, get assigned to them and um, contact them and do their intake, set up a service plan to work on uh, the goals that this, the client says they need to they need to and want to work on. Some of the things that the client says that they want to work on, even though they're uh, referred to service coordination, um, may be what we call the IAR. So, um, so they might be have goals on their service plan, but they're, they're also going to get some IARs in addition, because as I said, life happens, uh, different things come up at different times. Um, and then we have our office hours. Uh, the locations are, are available on ISIC's website, which I will give you uh, in another slide. Um, and um, Literacy Pittsburgh has virtual office hours. So, and there's a few other office hours um, that uh, JFCS and uh, I think one of the other agencies has office hours um, right now during COVID. Um, once things get back to normal and uh, more in person, um, all the agencies will have their office hours again in person and it'll most likely go back to pre-COVID uh, where it's a, a walk-in uh, office hours, first come, first serve during the, the times of the office hours. And the office hours kind of work as um, the intake. So um, instead of like referring them online or calling, the, the person can just go to the office hours and the, the, um, the um, staff member, uh, whoever's doing office hours that day will decide, is this an intake? I mean, is this an IAR only? Like just, do I just need to refer them out very quickly and get, give them some quick assistance? or does this client need service coordination? So, um, or it might be a combination of both. Um, so um, if the person doing office hours deems that they need to be put in service coordination, then they'll be put on the wait list for, and be matched with the, the service coordinator. So again, what should tutors do? If your student needs help in any way uh, for them or their family, uh, like, you know, my child is, uh, um, uh, is sick or they, uh, I need to apply for a site for my, my kid and I can't, I don't know what to do or um, my, my child uh, um, isn't getting the ESL classes that they need or um, I can't pay my rent, I need help finding a job, um, whatever it may be that is outside your realm of the learning plan and their education goals at Literacy Pittsburgh you should contact your program coordinator right away. Don't wait for the, the monthly report unless the month you're turning in your monthly report that day. <laughs> um, but just shoot, shoot the court, your coordinator an email. Uh, let them know which student, uh, first and last name, because uh, some of our students have the same uh, first and last name. Um, and or first name, sorry. So, um, so first and last name of the student and what they need help with. And then that coordinator will um, complete um, uh, an in-house Isaac referral for the student, which will refer them to our virtual office hours for Literacy Pittsburgh students. And oops, and Nora, who is our AmeriCorps member um, for Isaac, will contact them and um, by phone um, and do a virtual appointment. Um, yeah, and she will decide if they need to be referred to service coordination if they have more intensive needs or if it's something that she can handle uh, in like one or two meetings with a like 30, 30 minutes meetings with the student. One thing that is important is mm -hmm. to make sure that um, your student is okay with having somebody call them. Uh, we do have to have consent from the student. Yes. It also helps the Isaac folks because if they call the student, the student has no idea who this person is and why they're calling them. Then it's, just a, it's a lot of confusion. So just make sure that you let them know that you're going to, you know, I'm going to find you help with this. I'm going to have somebody call you. So. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, that's what the point I was, like, I was supposed to put something on the slide. I could not remember what it was. Yes, that, that is it. So always get their permission before referring. Um, uh, because as Laurel said, um, they need to know that 
uh, that someone might be calling them in, in like within a week or something. Um, and uh, um, and in the um, email you send your coordinator, um, state uh, give a, some kind of idea of what they need. Uh, they asked help with or their their one of their their needs or all the needs that if they gave you a whole list. And um, if um, uh, just a quick reminder, so the coordinator won't have to look it up, uh, what language they speak. Uh, so we can call with um, that um, language interpreter on the phone. So, so who is eligible for, for Isaac? Um, anybody who lives in Allegheny County who is an immigrant. So it doesn't matter how long they, they lived here. Um, it doesn't matter um, if they're a citizen already, as long as they were not born in the United States. So it could be a Canadian, it could be a, someone from England, it could be someone from Australia, <laughs> they're an immigrant. Um, uh, so as long as they weren't born here, it doesn't matter if they speak the language or not, they um, are, and they live in Allegheny County, they are eligible for Isaac services. We do not ask for any proof of documents. So we do help undocumented as well. Um, and uh, because uh, they're, they're very similar to our asylum seekers. They don't qualify for any services um, like welfare or social security, no government services, I should say. So um, we have to find other, yeah, sorry, my dog. We have to, uh, <laughs> I was, he was doing so good. I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, we have to um, uh, find agencies. What, um, one moment. We have to find agencies, so sorry, that um, are able to serve in um, people who are kind of in limbo uh, when it comes to documents. A lot of our undocumented immigrants also have US born children. So um, the children can qualify for benefits. So, um, and, and it's a lot of times about the children. We want to make sure the children are taken care of. Uh, they have the food. They have a. They have clothes. They have a place to sleep. Um, they have medical insurance. So if they were, if their child was born in the U.S., the child will qualify. We will apply for the children um, using the parents' names and stuff. But we don't have to supply any documents about the parents. We will just supply the documents about the children uh, to make sure they get services that they need. But again, they have to reside in Allegheny County, and I'm stressing that because. Um, especially during the COVID time, uh, we're getting more students that do not live in Allegheny County. Um, and we have some students who live in Beaver County because we all, um, Literacy Pittsburgh serves Beaver County, but Isaac doesn't. It's only Allegheny County because it's an Allegheny County grant. So um, what about our non-immigrant students? So uh, students who are, who are uh, naturally born U.S. citizens, we have a student support specialist, Najla Ibrahim, who um, uh, was actually part of our original Isaac team. So she learned a lot during her time in Isaac. A lot of the, um, she was our bilingual navigator, but she also helped out a lot with service coordination appointments. So uh, she um, gained a lot of knowledge about the community services that are available to the community at large uh, to um, help people become uh, more self-sufficient and, and um, sustain their life, uh, you know, their housing and, and everything. So she uh, works with CCR students who are not immigrants. Um, <clears throat> and um, unfortunately, some of our ELL students are naturally born US citizens. So we need to find out, we can't just assume that they were not um, born in the United States, because there are a couple of our students that were born in the US and then their parents went back to Mexico or Canada or something like that. And they were raised in another country um, and they don't know English, you know, they're learning English and stuff like that. So, um, um, uh, but that is something that we will find out at intake. If you don't want to ask that question, were you born in the United States <laughs> or where were you born? Um, you don't have to ask that question. We'll find out on our end. But if um, uh, there just might be, if uh, there will be an internal referral to Najla for any of the students that are referred to us that are not um, actually immigrants. Um, so Najla will identify barriers to student success and refer students to services that reduce or eliminate barriers. So very similar to Isaac. Um, so if you have any um, 
students. So I'm assuming all of you only teach um, ELL students, um, but if uh, you you also teach a CCR student, um, you you know that you now know that there's Najla here to help them. CCR stands for College and Career Readiness. Oh, just if sorry. you were wondering. <laughs> Sorry it's about a that. State, yeah, it's a state acronym. It's just how they label students who are U.S. born and that we are get, working to get them ready for college or career is, yeah. is kind of what it means. So G it's usually GED students. students. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, yeah, I'm like, I should not have put the call, uh, acronym, but I was thinking, oh, they're tutors, but I forgot they're our ELL tutors. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So, um, and she'll follow the same referral process. Um, so uh, contact, I'm sorry, you should follow the same referral process for those students. So just contact your program coordinator, give the same information and Najla will contact them. And the coordinator will let Najla know and she'll contact them. So that's Isaac and Student Support Services at University of Pittsburgh in a nutshell. Are there any questions? Were there anything in the chat? Okay, just what services are immigrants allowed to receive, i.e. from from the government? Well, if they're a green card holder, they uh, like a permanent resident, they are eligible for pretty much any of the same services, almost um, all of the same services as a US citizen, because uh, they've already been vetted, they've already gone through a whole process to get that green card. and. Um, usually green card holders are on the pro it's a step towards citizenship so um uh um some of the parents some of the adults there is a, a like um for welfare there's a certain types of welfare there's a uh um a, a bar so they can only qualify for some of the welfare benefits for a certain period of time until they become a citizen i think it's three year uh, for the first three years of their green card and then um they have to um uh, wait until their citizenship. But for the most part, they're eligible for um, any of the, of the same services we are. They can get financial aid, they can um, uh, get SSI. Um, but SSI, I should state, um, there is a cap on the limit. So um, someone with a green card, if they get S social security income benefits, they can only get it for seven years because the government is expecting them within that seven years to get their citizenship. If they don't, then uh, during that seven year time, then they cannot, uh, then their benefits will end. Okay, um, well, what about, what about food aid? Can they receive, can they receive food aid for essentially the rest of their life? Uh, I, it's all based on income, but uh, I don't know about the rest of their life, <laughs> but they can get food stamps um, and they can get um, medical insurance for their children. Uh, they qualify for WIC for any pregnant woman, even if they're not um, a, a, a resident, a permanent resident, a green card holder. Uh, if they're pregnant, um, they qualify for um, WIC um, because that child will most likely be a US citizen and they want to make sure that child is born healthy. Um, and um, they qualify for WIC up until, while they're pregnant, and I, I, mean, I believe, um, uh, yeah, and, and medical, emergency medical assistance, because um, they wanna make sure the mother's getting the medical care she needs. Um, and, uh, and I think the mother keeps the medical, from what I remember, the mother keeps the medical assistance up until the first um, after the first uh, follow up appointment after birth. Okay. Well, what about okay? Something like act, actually, what's what's bringing up this question is okay. Immig immigrants um, that for some reason, most likely age when they came here, um, who don't learn enough English mm -hmm. to become US citizens, um, but they live in county housing and they receive federal commodity supplemental food program that's senior boxes. 
it every situation is different so i would need to know the the situation um sometimes um they may uh be in process for citizenship and, and waiting for their waivers uh, um, so depending on their age, so there's an age waiver that can, that an um, older person can apply for, uh, to, um, to, uh, uh, not have to do the English component and, uh, there's an exam waiver as well. Citizenship isn't my, um, I'm not a, a lawyer. I'm not a, ad, a legal advocate either. Um, uh, um, legal representative, sorry. So, um, but from what I know, uh, that's how it, it goes. So there are waivers that are avail available for people to apply for um, if they meet certain conditions when it comes to applying for citizenship. Um, but when it comes to the, the low-income housing and the, the other services, it depends on, on those specific age, um, this, well, especially the food services, uh, it depends on those specific agencies' requirements, uh, eligibility requirements. Um, and um, for the low-income, uh, if the person's working, you know, if they have their green card, um, they can just continue renewing their green card, renewing the green card. Um, as long as they're working, um, it's based on um, income. So for the, for that um, guidance. And determining eligibility is something that Isaac can help with too. Mm -hmm. You don't have to decide yeah. if your student is eligible. You can just send them to us and or to mm -hmm. Isaac and they will they'll figure all that out. Yeah. Yeah. With well, our intake ac questions. Actually, actually the reason, the reason why I'm asking is that I deliver senior boxes once a month okay. to, to the homestead, to people in the homestead apartments. There were so many Russians that speak poor, little to no English that they have, you know, no smoking and COVID signs in the buildings in both Russian and English. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it, but it does bring up that if their English, if their English is so poor that they need signs in Russian, mm -hmm. okay, then probably some, at least some of them are not citizens. Yet this is senior, this is senior housing, okay? And a lot of them are, how should we say, they're physically past working. So, um, okay, I mean, we're, you know, there are, there are people who don't, who, who probably are, who have Russian names that are, for example, um, using walkers mm -hmm. and, you know, definitely, definitely are you know not going to be working anymore well i wouldn't assume that they're not citizens yet but you also don't know when they came because uh, people right. cannot apply for citizenship until they've had their green card for five years so some of them might be asylum seekers uh with with work permits or like living i mean they might uh actually if it's a senior housing then no uh so um but you don't know when they came uh, and so i don't um, know when they came yeah so um it also, the, the owner of the complex might be of Russian descent, so uh, he, uh, he or she might uh, uh, have a, a soft place for, you know, uh, Russian immigrants, uh, so, uh, and, and, and is helping them uh, obtain ho affordable housing. We, we just don't know the situation, but ne um, we should never assume. Um, they may just uh, not have uh, met the the time requirements yet for applying for citizenship, or maybe they have, but they may have come uh, also when um, uh, 10 years ago uh, with family um, who has, um, and their family just is unable to help them. And, and, and it was better that they lived in a senior community. Um, and maybe they were already older and they just were unable to uh, get to English lessons and things like that. They were, uh, uh, I mean, we just don't know. We, we, assumptions should never be made. So, but um, yeah, it, um, so I don't know what the question exactly was about this. Okay, I'm basic, basically, I'm basically, I'm wondering, you know, I'm wondering why, you know, wondering what it is that makes it 
makes it legal for them if they're not citizens to be able to get a fed food that comes through a federal program. They're probably green very, card holders. They very, de very definitely that they have to have very low incomes. It's absolutely the lowest income limit that I've seen for any of the food programs. And also I know that the owner of their housing is the Allegheny County Housing Authority. Oh, okay, so it's a, 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 a ACHA. This, this is this is they're in they're in public they're in public. Okay, housing. so they they need to be green. They card are green card holders. holders. Yeah, they're green card holders. You can't get that if you are yeah. um, undocumented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, they're green card holders and maybe citizens now. Who knows? Um, but uh, um, what was going to say, and they might be um, getting SSI. You know, um, so benefits. Uh, due to their um, their disabilities and, and age. So, um, and, and maybe mental illness, because I mean, just because they speak Russian, I mean, they could be from a few different countries, uh, a few different countries speak Russian. So, um, uh, and uh, some of the countries have seen war and, and, um, and uh, dictatorship and things like that. Um, so there might be PTSD and mental illness uh, that help them qualify in addition to any of their physical uh, and emotional or physical disabilities um, for SSI. And as I said, uh, green card holders have, uh, the, if they qualify for SSI, they can have it for about seven years before um, uh, losing it. Um, of course, there is an appeal process and things like that, um, but uh, if they do lose it, um, but uh, they have seven years to get their citizenship. And so if they ha get SSI and, and, and everything, the chances of them uh, getting approved for a waiver might increase uh, for the, uh, the English component of the citizenship uh, interview and the exam. So, but again, okay. I'm not a legal, uh, legal person. So um, uh, that is a to the uh, USCIS and the immigration lawyers and stuff to decide and, and work out. So, but yeah, assumptions uh, should never be made um, um, as you know, so. Do you have any other questions? No. Anybody? No. Okay. Did I answer your question to your satisfaction, Kathy? Um, yeah, you did, you did indicate that it's possible for them to be non-citizens yet still live in county housing and still receive a federal program. Because they're green card holders and have been vetted yeah. and stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, anyone? Roberta, Ellen? Let's see, is there anything in the chat? Um, oh, great, awesome. Okay, well, thank you, Ellen. Um, so if there are no questions, um, let me go to the last slide here. Um, if you have any questions um, after this presentation, feel free to contact me or, or Laurel. Um, and if Laurel doesn't know the answer, she can ask me. Um, and if I don't know the answer, I'll find out <laughs> from uh, one of our partners um, or my team even. Because uh, um, Andrea, team, this this is Roberta. I had a quick question. Sure. Um, my student is here on asylum with the work permit. Can she get a social security card or not? Uh, it, if she has a work permit, she does get a social, she should have a social security card. Okay. It, it should come with the work per, or around the same time as the work permit. Okay. Uh, some students get some people, asylum seekers get the social security card first and the work permit right afterwards, or sometimes it's flip-flopped, but okay. her social security card should stay, stay across it for work purposes only. Um, and um, if she is granted asylum, um, it's taking some time. <laughs> I'm glad she has her work permit, though. Um, it's taking some time um, for these. I'm um, assuming she has a work permit because she's working. Uh, well, I, yeah, I, I shouldn't assume that. <laughs> yeah, you shouldn't assume that. You shouldn't assume because okay. asylum seekers cannot apply for their work. Per so asylum seekers cannot apply for the work permit until one year after they have submitted their application for asylum. It used to be six months, but the Trump administration um, extended it to a year. So during that year, they have to survive. And so um, it's either they get uh, family assistance from their country, um, they get assistance through Isaac connecting them to their agencies. But again, that's not, I mean, it's not 
um, non-exhaustive, right? So um, uh, some of them, um, uh, many of them will find work under the table. Okay. Um, and um, it, a lot of them don't want to because they're scared that it might hinder their chances, but they need to survive. A lot of them have families. Um, so, um, but they're, um, if uh, your student needs uh, any assistance, uh, um, you can refer her to, to um, your coordinator who then refer her to Isaac and we'll see what we can help out with uh, getting okay. connected to. Um, but unfortunately there is a process that um, the legal process, we just have to wait. Like if, if she's not eligible to apply for a work permit yet, we have to wait for the year. Um, and are you sure she submitted her application already? Uh, she's been here for three years. Oh, okay. okay. Then I'm sure. Oh, yeah, she has her work permit then. I okay. Because uh, that, uh, that was I know she COVID. doesn't have a social security card because she wanted to open a, a checking account or like to get a debit card. And she didn't have a social security number in it. And she could either have a social security number or a green card or she doesn't have a green card. So I don't know what the scoop is. Uh, that's interesting. She should have a social security card if she has a work permit. So uh, if she doesn't have one, please refer her to Isaac and we'll see what's okay. uh, going on because uh, it may have been lost in the mail. Okay. And because uh, uh, if she lives in an apartment, um, those apartment complexes, some of those uh, postal boxes, mailboxes are just a nightmare. So um, <laughs> um, yeah, so um, hopefully... Uh, somebody didn't take it and has been using it in her name because also if she's been if she does have a work print and she doesn't have a social security number we would need to find out if she's been filing taxes because if she's working legally she needs to be filing taxes so um and um we would need to find that out to see if she needs to um if she hasn't then we need to get her to a um uh file back taxes um so yeah, um, talk to her and see if she's okay, uh, uh, okay with uh, you referring her to Isaac to see okay. if, um, if we can help her. Any other questions? Comments, concerns? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you so, so much for um, coming tonight. I do hope you guys got some uh, good information um, from tonight's presentation. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me or Laurel. Our emails are right there. Um, or you can contact your program coordinator directly. It's like, say I have a question, you know, um, uh, or my, I have a concern about my student. And, and as I said, don't wait until you uh, your monthly report because um, um, a lot can happen between the time your students tells you something and the time your monthly report is due. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording, if it'll let me. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, stop recording.